You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 146. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Winston Churchill. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, today on the show, we have Thomas Dever. Now, Thomas is the head of writer success over at Coverfly. And he pretty much knows what's going on on the street. He, he's there talking to agents, managers, producers on a daily basis and helping screenwriters connect with them and showing them what, uh, what they're looking for and so on. And Thomas and I had a fantastic conversation about where we are in the industry today, what screenwriters need to do in order to get their screenplays seen, uh, and, and a lot of little tips and tricks on how to get your project out into Hollyweird. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Thomas Dever. I'd like to welcome the show, Thomas Dever. How are you doing, Thomas? I am doing well. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> oh, man, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, you know, you and I have been working... Uh, together in a in a way for a while now because you you guys work uh, you work with Coverfly who works with me on um, bulletproof script coverage and uh, why this hasn't happened earlier I have no idea so I'm glad you're here now and we're gonna talk all things about the business and uh, how to you know I hope that you have all the answers Thomas because I have all of the answers because you know the one. there's a lot of screenwriters listening right now who want to know how to make it and I was told you know. So we're going to get into this. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you get started in the business? Oh, I mean, I, I feel like I've got the pretty usual story that I, I grew up in the Midwest and film industry was just this mythical thing way out on the West Coast. And pretty much as soon as I finished undergrad, packed up my stuff and moved out without really kind of any clue of what I was going to do, or how it was going to work. <laughs> Um, just like, I think as soon as I realized, oh, people like actually do this for a living, these are actual like businesses and I can work at them. Um, just kind of, th that was all I wanted to do. Um, you know, started internship to then reading with a production company that had first look studio deals. So we're really fortunate to get, um, that was my crash course on development and coverage and everything that goes into a film, um, before it gets made. And then from there I started working for a, uh, a producer that was working on a Fox searchlight film. So then that was my crash course on how a film actually gets made. <laughs> um, and then after that, I think everybody was kind of telling me, you know, you really got to work at the agencies. The agencies is what you do. That's kind of the way that you get into it. Um, I interviewed at two of them. I won't say which. Um, 
scared the hell out of me. Like genuinely the interview scared the hell out of me. Um, I remember walking out in my like nicest suit that I could find and telling the HR person like, yeah, I think you can take my name off the list. I don't think I can do this because I a little too thin skinned and a little too recent from the Midwest. Um, so then, yeah. So then I just kind of I think I used the verb uh, mid twenties <laughs> my way around around the industry for a little bit of uh, producing some things, continuing to sort of work in freelance capacity. Taught at a film school at one point um, before eventually finding my way to this, you know, this little world where we found each other, which you know, the competition and the coverage space. And truly, I went into it thinking, you know, I remember the scripts that I would write coverage on at the production company with the with the studio deal. And like, they weren't great. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. They really, I remember thinking, being a professional screenwriter is very attainable based on these samples. <laughs> and uh, so when I went into the competition, I was expecting like, Microsoft Word documents and typos and incoherent stories. Um, and I started reading for them and it was like, oh, this is, uh, this is really good. And this one's really good. And this writer is amazing. And these writers are every bit as talented. Like what, what's like my brain couldn't process it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it all sort of clicked to me of the, like all at once, the sort of barriers to entry, not necessarily being your skill set or your quality of your writing or your dedication or your discipline. It's all of these other sort of things, you know, be it geographic or socioeconomic or, you know, you know, these, these sort of cliches of who, you know, in the industry. Um, and then I, I think the, the rest is history kind of it's just really dedicating to this competition space. And then ultimately the, the platform that became Coverfly and and creating those opportunities and providing that level of access and insight and resources to the writers that um, you know weren't fortunate enough to just have that readily available. What was what's so fascinating, and, and I think a lot of screenwriters don't understand this. They they think that good writing and good screenplays are are unicorns. Where mm -hmm. I mean, you've read thousands of scripts probably in your career. I've read a ton of scripts over the years, and I've read some stuff from really accomplished screenwriters, mm -hmm. people who have published, like have produced screenplays, some of them even with some Oscar nominations, I've read some mm -hmm. of these scripts and they can't get them financed. They mm -hmm. can't, they can't get them in. Sure. And then, and it just like, I, it's disheartening. I'm like, wait a minute, this thing is sitting on someone's shelf for the last 10 years. It mm -hmm. is amazing. It's one of the best scripts I've ever written and no one's financing this with, with talent attached. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what, what is going on? Let alone the unknown scripts that I've read from screenwriters who are so talented. And I'm like, why are some, why do some pop and why do some don't? And sure. it's, I mean, I'd love to ask that question to you. Like why do, and it's a hard question. Like why does one guy or one gal make it or get the opportunity, the door opens for them and the other one doesn't. If their talent is at the same level, you know, is, you know, give or take. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a strange thing, right? I, uh, I love a good craft panel or lecture and I love like craft is undoubtedly more fun than the business, but the, the business considerations are what are deciding it because like, of course they are, you know, the, that this is, uh, you've brought commerce into it. And these are, these are companies that are distributing projects. And that doesn't mean that they're all Philistines that hate art. <laughs> it just means that there's, <laughs> there are considerations and what happens here um, other than simply what is on the page. And I think that you can find a ton of examples of those of, of projects that were, you know, not in demand and then, you know, wait a few years and suddenly they, they are. And, and your script that everyone was passing on is, is aligns with that. Um, because the one thing I would say to your question is you can't like so much of it is out of your control. Like so much of it is out right. of your control. Right. Um, I don't know anybody that can write fast enough to either anticipate or accommodate like the trends, which of course are going to be changing on a, on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> and I also don't know if I've met a screenwriter 
that can pander, you know, that, that can write something just because they think it's popular and not really it's have hard. like a, it's, it's too yeah, hard. It, it's too hard, I, man. I, I recycle the cliche that like, look, if it wasn't fun for you to write, it's really not going to be fun for me to read <laughs> um, or watch and, or and watch I, yeah, or watch. Right. And I, and I think anybody can see through that. So really, I think our approach to it, you know, if you sort of consider whether your goal is getting staffed on a series or signing with representation or getting your project option or sold, like the last step of that is a decision maker reading it and responding to the material. And there's nothing that you can do to make that happen. Like there's literally nothing that you can do. They're either going to like it or they're not. And so if you accept that, like the final stage of this, you have zero control over it sort of puts in perspective, put your energy towards the things that you can control, right? Which is the, 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 the material that you're putting out, the, the putting out the best possible version of it, networking, creating those opportunities, getting in front of those decision makers, I guess, to increase the odds of them responding to it and increasing the odds of this scenario that you have no control over. Um, because I would say the, the two, uh, the two most common things that I have seen in these sort of writers that quote unquote make it, which is maybe like a separate discussion of what making it means. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But the, the two most common things that I've seen is uh, one, they they just they work their ass off. Like they truly just when when I meet the sort of more six su- most successful or busiest writers or highest level writers that I know, it's like, oh, hey, what have you been up to? And they're like well, I just did a draft of this feature and I'm doing a polish on this treatment and I'm also going out with this other thing. And that's just in like the past couple of weeks, you know, that it is just, you have to crank out the material and, and, and it is just, um, it's so really the discipline and the dedication to it. Um, and then the other trait is just, uh, a clear focus, like a, a really clear kind of focus on, what their strengths are, what their goals are, what they want to do, what they're good at. And this kind of on this knack for not ever getting knocked off of that, 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 that not having a sort of like 10 step plan that goes to hell if step two doesn't go as you thought it was going to, that it's just like, yeah, I'm going to be a staff writer and, oh, this didn't pan out. So I'm going to try this pathway and getting an opportunity. That's not like a literal one-to-one of what they're trying to do, but seeing like, okay, here's the parts of this that can move me towards my goal. So that's what I'm going to get out of this opportunity. Um, and, and so th- that's the closest thing that I can sort of identify in terms of uh, commonality. Yeah. And, and, and again, that, that I love that you, you said that what is the definition of success? <laughs> and so many screenwriters think it's getting that million dollar spec script or two million dollar spec script or. Uh, but, you know, I always look at success now and this is maybe just because I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit older now. It's just like, can I make can I can I make a living doing what I love to do? Mm-hmm. Can I keep my the roof over my head, uh, you know, food on the table, send my kids to school, you know, live a, a comfortable life? I don't need millions. Can I just right. do what I love to do? And mm-hmm. that's, a, that's a disconnect for a lot of screenwriters because they're sold so oftenly, they're sold the lottery ticket. I always use the term lottery ticket mentality. They're mm-hmm. sold, you know, and it goes back to Shane Black and, and Joe Esterhaus mm-hmm. back in the 90s when they were pulling in two, three, four million dollars. Uh, a um, a picture or a script. Uh, do you know right. the story? Do you know the Do you know the the story? I have to tell. I haven't told the story on the show. I don't. Before. Know I, I don't. The, no, no. Just to that, like what you're gonna say that like the industry that um Blake Snyder describes and Save the Cat, where it's just kind of like I'm just popping off ideas. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Like that's the industry that I want to work in because that's definitely oh god that was it was I'm seeing at the moment. <laughs> no, it's great. There was a story um I heard from uh from a friend of mine about how Shane Black and his la- that movie Last Action Hero, which has got is the record four right. million. He got four million for right. that. He do you know that he sold that that script off of a cocktail napkin idea. I, th- it rings a bell. It sounds like I read this in a Grantland article way back when. Or it was. I just heard it. this. I was at AFF the other day, and I was talking to somebody at the bar. And I know the. I know the. You know. I, I know. It's a. It's a reputable person I'm talking to. So they're like, "This is how it happened." Mm-hmm. Apparently, the agent um, of Shane said, "Hey, do you have an idea for a movie?" And he's like, "Yeah, I have a great idea for a movie." He goes, 
write it on this cocktail napkin. He wrote the log line on the cocktail, no script, log mm-hmm. line on the, on the cocktail napkin. And then um, that agent called every studio head <laughs> in Hollywood and said, I've got Shane Black's next script on a cocktail napkin and you need to come to my office and, and you can read it in my office. And wait a minute. And he goes, you can't send anybody. It has to be you. So all the six or seven major studio heads all came down to the office, read it, and there was a bidding war off of over co- the lo- over cocktail. off of the cocktail napkin log line and ended up being four million for Last Action Hero, which then of course did not do well. And Shane uh Shane had a little rough time for the next uh decade. Uh until he came back. We got we got nice guys eventually. Right? No, we no. What brought him back was Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Oh, there we go. Sorry, Kiss I, Kiss, Kiss Bang I, Bang I, brought him back. That's like 20, 25 years. But there. he was out. But he was out for about I think he was about fourteen years. Like he would like he couldn't get arrested. Sure. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't get arrested. It was serious. But then he finally got Kiss Kiss Bang Bang made, and then that launched him back into right, right. into good graces. <laughs> but that was, and I use that story as a as an example of how, the insanity. That I think that was the. Yeah height of the um the the being drunk i think it was just being drunk on these spec script situations back then sure yeah i mean well uh that story's uh that story's way sexier right oh god it's super sexy if you're if you're (laughs) sitting at home because writing is such an isolating thing right Mm -hmm. it's literally you you and the screen and the keyboard it's it's so lonesome um that i feel like it's more romantic to picture just coming up with this once in a generation idea and then the 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 millions of dollars based off of that i think that's maybe a more enticing story to hear than just yeah you just like you work your ass off every day and you take these sort of progression these progressive steps with with your career and you sort of grind that's, your way up to that that's level, not sexy you know? at all that's not i don't want to hear that thomas i want to hear the cocktail napkin story thomas i don't want right. to hear i have to work hard for this <laughs> yeah <laughs> no and that's i mean that's the thing is it's uh and you know even with the even with that i feel like it's not like it's not like they pulled shame black's name out of a hat right oh no no he had, he was yeah, he had already great, s- exactly he wrote lethal weapon <laughs> 10 to 15 years before that of the of the grind to get to it um but no i absolutely and i think that that is the um i understand the allure of thinking like that but but the the truth is or at least the more common thing that we're seeing is is just it's a job like anything else and it's difficult but you know like and, and so I'll give you another another story that might illustrate what we're talking about. When Shane was passing around Lethal Weapon, every studio passed on Lethal Weapon. Every studio passed on Lethal mm-hmm. Weapon. It was a young, from my understanding, it was a young Chris Moore, who is the Oscar-nominated producer of Goodwill Hunting and Project Greenlight. Mm-hmm. He did all that stuff. He read it and said, this is great. And he forced it up the ladder. Um, mm. And got someone to finally take a real look at it again and got it financed. But sure. it was passed on. Everybody passed it because it was such a – buddy cops were essentially the new – the buddy cop really came in with in 48 hours. Mm. And that was only probably a couple years prior to that. So it wasn't a thing yet. And people passed on it. So it was just like you had a champion. And then, of course, right. the talent was there, and then everything else blew up. After. And yeah, and I think that that kind of goes back to it, right? Which is um, what I was just saying a few minutes ago. The like, hey, the last step of this, you have no control over. That None. it was uh, <laughs> even a script as incredible as Lethal Weapon. It's getting to execs that are just not responding to it. But you keep you keep sending it out. You keep sending it out. You keep working on it until it finds the one, and you just find that one champion, and that's really kind of all you need sometimes. Well, yeah, I mean, finding that finding that champion and finding we all need champions. Everybody needs a champion. Mm-hmm. Spielberg had a champion. You know, Nolan, Shane, everybody, all these guys have champions. You know, if it wasn't for um, Steven Soderbergh, Nolan wouldn't have gotten. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I think it was uh, Insomnia, which then of course got him right. Batman, and then the rest is right. his history. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, so but you need someone to just go, hey, it's okay, but. You got to keep grinding. And that's the thing mm-hmm. that people, the screenwriters specifically don't understand is the grind. It's, it's the grinding day in, day out, do the work. Uh, I think the other thing is too, and I always, t- I always tell screenwriters this, that if you, if you have, if you've been working on a screenplay for seven years, 
you're not a professional screenwriter anymore. You should, right. you need to have t- 10, at seven years, you should have like five, 10 screenplays. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah, I mean, even to like what you were saying earlier, though, because I think that's one of the things that like we so Coverfly with uh, we have a dedicated team of people and we offer free consulting for screenwriters. And that's whether you're a professional screenwriter that's hit a, you know, hit a rut or you're just an emerging screenwriter. Well, you know, we'll consult and we'll help kind of come up with a focus and a plan moving forward. The first question I ask everybody is what's the dream? Like genuinely, what's, what is the dream? If I could snap, not like what you think you're supposed to be doing based on trends or what you think is realistically attainable given your circumstances, like genuinely, if I could like sprinkle pixie dust or snap my fingers, what would you be doing? Because like, let's figure out a way to do that. You know, that, that if your dream is to just make indie films that you write, direct, produce, that's an awesome dream. Let's figure out how to make that happen. You're probably not going to make that happen by cranking out pilot samples and trying to get staffed in a room because you think that that is like the more viable pathway. And you're going to do a lot of work and probably be unhappy. (laughs) Right. Even with that, your goal is to write and direct your own. And like, look, if you can find a way through that, that it's like, okay, I'll use this to ultimately get back to the goal, do that. But it's, you know, do, do, you know, like what you were saying, the like, um, finding a way to be happy with it. And and I think if your goal is to just self finance and make your own projects, like do it instead of living up to this, like that the only measurement of success is selling studio specs or something. It's, you know, that's, that's some person's dream, but that doesn't have to be yours. Right. No. And I think that what you said was, is so wonderful. It's being happy doing what you're doing because I mean, I always wanted my goal, my, my dream, if you were going to ask me that back when I was 22, I want to direct feature films. That's Mm -hmm. all I want to do. I want to direct feature films, but I jumped into post-production because that was a way to make a living. And I was very grateful for that, but I was probably in there a lot longer than I should have. Mm. And I should have really fought a lot harder to get out of just doing editing or color grading or post supervising or the other stuff that I was doing to make a living to the point where I got so unhappy. I was, I was mm-hmm. bitter. I was angry. I was, I always tell people the angry and bitter uh, story, which yeah. I, anytime I speak, in, I speak in front of our audience, I go, how many people here know an angry and bitter screenwriter? And then everyone raised their hands. I'm like, if you didn't raise your hand, you're the angry and bitter screenwriter everybody else knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but it's because you become angry and like that person is like, oh, I'm working in a, I'm working in a writer's room. I've been pounding out these pilots. I'm, I, I, it's horrible. I'm on like this f- fourth or fifth level <laughs> down sure. st- show somewhere in, right. you know, in the middle of the country or whatever. And I hate doing what I'm doing. But what I really want to do is what you just said. I want to write, I want to write, direct, produce my indirect indie films. Because that's, that's the thing. I think that there's this, uh, I don't know, there's this perception that, gosh, we're getting like so philosophical here. And it's like, Good. oh, there's this perception that money is going to make you happy. Like genuinely, post people do pretty well. And if you were working oh, on top level projects, I'm would, sure that there was I did, no I did, shortage. Right. <laughs> I did fine. I did. I kept, I, my, my, I was good. For a yeah. long time, uh, with post post, I can't say anything negative about it, but I wasn't happy doing it. Mm-hmm. Just, just as the same thing. If someone paid me a million dollars a year to, uh, to, you know, push a broom around mm-hmm. all day, right. and cl- I, 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 the money would be great. But at a certain point, you're just like, this is not what I want to do. This is not why I'm here. Right. And now, and you start asking the question, well, why am I here? Am I here to make money? Am I here to be happy? Now we're really getting deep into philosophy. Because well, that's, um, I mean, usually it's funny because now we're going through like the progression. It's like we're deconstructing a cover fly consultation call. Sure. Um, yeah. There's another question that I ask, right? Like you and I were saying before we fired it up, like we're crazy, right? This is, oh, like this, a is crazy industry this is insanity. This is insanity. You know, insanity. that I, I admire the conviction that I had in my early 20s that I'm just like, oh, I'll pack all of my possessions and just drive to a state 2,000 miles away. But like those, <laughs> yeah. you know, asking writers, it's, I ask what, uh, 
what is the like what do you sort of see coming up in everything that you write and not just like a format and a genre but like genuinely like what themes what like philosophical or stylistic consistencies like what are your projects like and what are they about followed up with like why is that because this is not something that you just think about or something that you're interested in this is something that you are compelled to express in the form of feature screenplays and pilots and shorts and and usually if we're you know talking with you not just that you're doing it pretty well (laughs) so like where that's coming from somewhere there is coming from some sort of innate need on your part to express this and and so I think that puts in full scope just how I don't know just like how much passion is behind this that that if you're trying to put it towards something that your heart isn't in, how much it is going to take out of you and why it is going to make you and just sort of suck your soul to the point that you were talking about. Um, Because this isn't, I don't know, this isn't like a job that you can just like, okay, I'm done at the end of the day. You're putting putting your heart and soul and your life (laughs) into this. Could you imagine Um, if you could just check out? Could you imagine if you just (laughs) clock out at five and like, okay, I don't, I'm not a filmmaker anymore. I'm not a screenwriter anymore today. Oh, thank God. Let me just, let me just, let me just get a beer and drink and just chill Mm -hmm. and not think about anything anymore. No, it's, I've called it a disease. It is a disease that you get bitten by the bug. And that bug, mm-hmm. and, and, and once you're bitten by the bug, it will never, ever, ever go away. It can go dormant for decades, but eventually it will resurface in one way, shape, or form. And I do this because I've talked to 65-year-olds who or 7-year-olds who's like, I'm retired now. What I really want to do is direct. And <laughs> it happens. And, and there's really – I don't even know what other industry there is that, that has that kind of insanity – you know, like, mm-hmm. look, I did the same thing you did. I did a little bit later in life. I didn't do it in my mid twenties. I did in my early thirties, where I packed up, moved mm-hmm. cross country to California, knew two people, yeah. <laughs> and this was my plan. My plan was oh, I had to rent a, an apartment in North Hollywood, mm-hmm. where one room would be where we slept, and the other room would be where I put up my editing system, and I was just going to show up. Now, mind you, I had sure. I, I had a decade of stuff behind me before I showed up, but even then, I just for whatever reason, I started working and I started working, I started working and it, it worked out, but it could have very easily crashed and burned. Oh yeah. I mean, it's the, it's the same thing, but I think that like, like you said, I, I mean, it sort of goes back to the, Hey, you have this like unwavering focus of what you're going to do and you don't right. have the sort of steps figured out, but you're just really not going to be denied <laughs> um, be, because yeah, because your heart is in it to that point. Um, and it is always fascinating, you know, to find so many people that are, really successful in other fields that this is like a a hobby for them or this is something that they're pursuing and this is you know I but that's I don't know that's what kind of makes it that's definitely what makes it so cool you know I think of all the uh I mean I tell people all the time I think I've just got like one of the greatest jobs that I of, of all the ways that you could kind of get up and earn a living and pay your bills um I get to get up every day and with an entire company full of people do something that we like genuinely truly care about um, and, and get to be with people that love the same things I love. And, and that's, that's what's so fun about stuff like this, you know, mm-hmm. that you were saying, you know, getting together at Austin film festival, we just, we kind of find one another, you know, <laughs> there's this, this, this little like family that seems to emerge around the screenwriting community. Yeah, I, absolutely. And uh, w- w- without question, it, this, I, when when I started helping people with my podcast and with my websites and things like that, my life changed. And I think mm-hmm. it, I, I'm blessed just like you. I get to do what I love to do on a daily basis. And uh, while I pursue my own projects and my, I pursue mm-hmm. my own, you know, books and stories and other things, other things mm-hmm. that I, I like to do. Now, one thing that um, a lot of screenwriters don't really get is the absolute necessity of networking. Mm-hmm. And being able to make those connections, but make them in a very organic yeah, way as opposed to, hey, man, I hear you're a producer. Here's my script. Yep. Yeah. Like, I just met you. Like, are you, yeah. you know, it's like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I think that there's a. Uh... I don't want to generalize writers and I'll say this, that I used to be the exact same way. I think Mm -hmm. that there's, it's not that 
networking just in, makes a lot of people uncomfortable mm-hmm. um, because let's let's just call networking what it is, which is talking to strangers. It's uh, you know it's, it, it it is starting a conversation with a stranger and 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 putting pressure on yourself to build a connection in a short amount of time. Um, and as a person that like I, my undergrad degree is in English. I sat in the back. I spent most of college just reading, you know, so believe like, yes, going and talking to people that I didn't know was like my worst fear at some point in time. So I think that there's a reluctance to do it. And that's what kind of fosters this idea of like, oh, it's just you just have to know this person and they just give these jobs to their friends and things like that. When it's like like there's certainly a degree of that in the industry, but there's like um, to, to put in perspective that if you're an exec or a producer or a showrunner or someone around those people, you're going to get a stack of like 200 scripts for one spot, maybe. And they're all going to be good. Yes, it's very common that you break the tie, so to speak, with the opinion of a person that you trust or a person that you know or a yep. person that you like or a person that you just you know is not going to let you down in that situation. So take that for whatever it's worth in the scope of networking. Um, but to what you were saying, yes, for some reason, the like sentiment around networking seems to be um, just pitching any stranger that <laughs> <laughs> that like returns eye contact with you. Um, and I, <laughs> I feel like there is, um, you've all been at a networking event, regardless of how big it is, where there's just a person there that's just kind of on like a loop <laughs> of just like, they give their project and their spiel to this person and then they give their project and their spiel to this person. And it's like, I, I think uh, surely someone listening to this right now is like, like they're feeling this like chills down. Their they're spine. cringing. They're cringing. Yes. Yeah. You know what it is like to be on the other side of that. Oh. So like, yeah, don't, don't be that person. Um, to me, I always say go in with questions, go in with learn about who this person is, what they do, what's important to them, what they're working on right now. Do they have any problems that you can solve? Do they have any projects that you can help on? And like, trust that if, they're working on something where there is a world for you to collaborate. It's going to come up by asking those questions that if you're, you have this amazing horror feature spec and you start, Hey, so what do you do? What sort of projects do you work on? What types of movies do you like? What types of material do you respond to? And they start saying, God, I just love horror films and we've got a financier and we're trying to find something like this that fits your project. That is such a better way to bring up your material and mention it to them versus going in and just being like, I've got a horror feature. This is what it's about. And you should read it. And here's that. And it's like, I work in TV. Why are you yelling at me? You know, or yeah. I'm also a screenwriter. I don't know what you want me to, to do. And it. I was like, walk, it's like walking up to Jason Blum and going, Hey, I've got this dog saves Christmas script. Yeah. Um, that's, I think you'll be perfect for it, Jason. Um, no. And I, and, and the funny thing is I, this is always infuriating. I get, cold emails Mm -hmm. about pitching projects to me. Mm. I have no power. (laughs) I can't finance your script. Uh, I'm not looking for projects to produce. All you got to do is listen to three or four of my podcasts or just read a couple articles and you'll understand who I am. And -hmm. people are just so desperate that they just just start throwing things out and and it just gets deleted automatically. But you start like emailing, you know, you get a, an IMDb Pro account and you just start emailing people your script. That is not the way to do it. The shotgun approach right. doesn't work. You've got to be more sure. surgical. Well, yeah. And that's the, I mean, we take the same approach because we do consult. I mean, the thing is like, am I going to pretend that queries have a high rate of success? No, they do not. However, we've worked with writers that have 100% found success with queries because I, I think that there's a there's a good way to do it. Um, and so if you, you know, so much of what we do is like, um, one, be really concise and articulate, get, get through who you are, why you're emailing them and what the ask is, um, as quickly as possible. Because if you're emailing a person that works in the entertainment industry, there's a good chance that they have like 200 emails in their inbox. And if they open it up and it is five paragraphs of boilerplate, like even if you are a dead center bullseye of what they're looking for right now, 
they just don't have time to do that and they're going to delete it. Um, and so like what you were saying with it, it's always like, here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's where I am like emailing you. I love it. If you, you know, if it's a fit, I'd love for you to take a look at my script. If not, no worries. Knowing that most people are not going to respond, but you might have a person that is looking exactly for that and you're respectful and got to the point and they're like, yeah, sure. Send the script. At this point, they've requested your material versus it's the equivalent of like, put again, put yourself in their shoes and use common sense of like attaching the script in the initial email. How would you feel if a person walked up to you on the street and was like, hey, I heard that you can help me spend two hours reading this script and giving me your thoughts on it. Your, your response 100% would be, it's awfully presumptuous of you. <laughs> <laughs> to, to just assume that I'm going to do this. And yet that that's kind of the common practice of queries, right? <laughs> right. It, it's, it's, it's a fairly insane, <laughs> it's insanity, man. It, it really is. And, and so I also wanted to ask you this, because I actually had this question from a screenwriter the other day. Should a screenwriter sign a submission release form if they're submitting to a producer or a company or something like that? They're, the thing is like they're, they're common practice, you know, they're, they're commonplace. So don't think that you're signing your life away, you know, I guess read it and make sure you're not signing your life away. Um, but I am guessing that somewhere in all of them, there's going to be a cause that it's like, look, if you a year or two, five years from now, see that we have a project that looks really similar to something that you submitted to us, like you can't sue us. Um, and the reason that's the case is because you can imagine what companies would be opening themselves up to if they didn't do that. That if you, you know, they're already, I think, getting sued all the time from people trying to claim that. But it, but if every script that was submitted to them, that any line or story or beat or commonality that like appeared in a project that was later produced, that's why they're doing it. Um, at the same time, I... I don't think that you have any problem in signing it. I, I think that there's no, I don't know anybody that isn't looking for an amazing script. And if they read your script and love it and really respond to it, they'll work with you because I think that there's a perception among writers or a fear that, Oh, they're going to read it and like my idea and steal it. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't know if I've really seen that. I don't really know why they why they necessarily would do that. But at the same time, I totally get where the fear is coming from. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had heard of some people's ideas getting stolen or re, re, and when I say stolen, it's more like, you know, they took a couple of kernels and sure. all of a sudden now they have something new. I mean, I remember when we were uh, this years ago when I had a script f uh, floating around that got to Sony and uh, I said they asked for it because they'd seen mm -hmm. one of my one of my uh, films, and I said I submitted it to them, and they're like, "Oh, we're going to pass because we have something similar in theme." And then mm -hmm. two years later, that movie came out, which was not not anything yeah. like not anything like my script at all. Mm -hmm. But there were ideas sure. and themes oh. there, so you have to protect yourself as a. No, hundred percent. I I guess what I you should a hundred percent protect yourself. You should. It's one of the biggest things that I think is valuable about a platform like Coverfly because you you know we have the writer platform where you can host your projects in your bio, and then we have a industry facing portion of it where they can search for writers and projects. Um, but we really closely monitor the activity on that side of it. And so if somebody downloads your script, we have a timestamp of when they downloaded it. And this isn't necessarily a commercial for the data protection that is Coverfly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's to drive home the point that like, yes, you should be precious with your material. And then I think with a submission release form, passing it along through a friend or having them request it is always going to be the better option. So I would advise that. Um, with it, I will say, um, by no means am I an attorney and you should always check with an attorney. Absolutely. <laughs> blindly taking my advice. Um, the consensus is you cannot copyright an idea, only the execution of an idea. Correct. Um, cause I do think that like most screenwriters I know have had like an idea that they were super excited about and then they see like a trailer or they read in the trades an idea that is really similar and I'm not going to pretend that that doesn't just like 
it happens all to be on the other end of all the, the time are you kidding me when i but saw when i saw clerks by kevin smith i was working in a video store i'm like son of a bitch why didn't i God, i had this idea why didn't i just execute it well there you go <laughs> and, and like no truly and and so i'm i i get it i feel the pain of writers in that situation what i will say though is that I don't want to say that ideas are cheap. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But like good ideas are good ideas are easier to come by than the execution of good ideas. Truly, um, I think most screenwriters I know come up with like five blockbusters in the shower and on their way to work in the morning. You know, it's just like you're coming up with these ideas, and really the tough part is in executing it. Um, so as tough as that can be, it sort of goes back to what we were saying earlier of like you got to be cranking out material because. Man, if you're just kind of hinging all your hopes on one project, you you are kind of opening yourself up to that, right? You are you are sort of opening yourself up to like, oh, I have to make this one thing go versus like really utilizing your talents to give yourself multiple opportunities. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, and I, I wanted to ask you as well and, and kind of put this to rest for so many screenwriters out there. I, this is my opinion. I'd love to hear yours. I get asked all the time, how do you protect your screenplay? I go, you mm -hmm. register it with the, the, the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. That's the only one that matters. You could do it with the WGA. That's nice, but the WGA does not hold up in court. The, the Library of Congress, right. that's the only one that you have the boom and it's that. And, it, and, you can, and again, you can't do the idea, but you can do the actual screenplay. That's right. the only way I know of and uh, that I, I always recommend. Why about you? Sure. I mean, and that's, I mean, if that's, um, you're probably going to do that, right, if your film is moving into any sort of production, right? Because at some point, unless you're just kind of shooting the project yourself, somebody else is going to need to own the script and, and they're, well, they're has, going to protect yeah, their – yeah. Right. Once it gets into production, that's an, you have to have that. That's part right, of right. chain of title. But prior to that, while you're pitching and things like that, to make you feel better as a screenwriter, you want to have that sure. protection, spend 35 bucks, 40 bucks. Get it covered yeah. and don't mail it to yourself. That doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a myth. Don't mail it to yourself. Because <laughs> that's the thing. I think that like what you said there is it's making yourself feel better and, and giving yourself the peace of mind to know that you've protected this version of this story. Um, otherwise, I think it's always good to have a paper trail. Right. And and because I know that getting um, getting an attorney can be prohibitively expensive for a lot of emerging screenwriters. Why it's just, it's kind of like cover your bases to, to as much as is necessary for it. You know, if you're in the sort of like talking stages of a project and there's no real money on the table, you probably don't need a 15 page contract, right? <laughs> to like to define terms of what, you know? Right. Um, but, but I think always just be really clear and I think this goes into a lot of what we've been saying, whether it's like working with a producer or with a collaborator, especially when you sign with representation, because that's a whole separate discussion we get with writers is just be really clear about being on the same page of expectations, because um, I think that that's where a lot of problems come from. Right. Which is uh, with I think a lot of writers with producers are being are afraid of getting taken advantage of or afraid of their material being mishandled, which is why, you know, before you embark on a working relationship, establish if the expectation is like, okay, we want to, we want you to, we want to develop this with you. Does that mean one draft and a polish? Or does that mean like infinite rewrites until I'm happy with it over some non-specific period of time? Because if you think one thing and they think another, the project's kind of doomed before it even gets started. And, and same applies to working with, uh, with a manager or an agent. Which brings me to my next question, the agent and manager conundrum. Mm -hmm. Where yes. there's so many screenwriters think that all you need is Ari Gold from Entourage. <laughs> and if they represent you, they're going to get you the million dollars. They're going to get your career. And it's right. and then people are like, how can I get an agent? How can I get a manager? I'm like, and I always ask them, how many scripts do you have? Mm -hmm. I, have I have one and a couple of ideas. I'm like, you're not ready for an mm -hmm. agent. And, right. I've, and I've known writers who've won the nickels. Who have placed in the nickels? Who have placed in multiple sure. big, uh, and they get signed, and the, they go, they go nowhere because the management is like, should I push Shane Black? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> or should I put? Should I push Bob, <laughs> who I just signed? Talented, right. but what's going to be? The, how am I going to make? When am I going to make the most money from? Where's my money? Where's my ROI and ROT? Right. You know, going right. to make the most sense. So, can you please de- kind of demystify the whole agent manager thing for people? It is undoubtedly the most popular question <laughs> that we get. And I don't, I actually don't know what's even a close second. It, it is always, how do I get a manager, right? That is the, that is the, <laughs> the holy grail of emerging screenwriters. And I get it, right? Because I think that the perception is, I, I think you're sort of feeling that frustration of being on the outside looking in, the lack of access, the lack of opportunity. And like, yes, a manager and agent can solve that. But if there is this perception that like, okay, great, I signed with a manager, I cracked my knuckles, I put my feet up and I just wait for the deals to roll in. That's definitely <laughs> like not the case, right? Like it is, it, it is you're going to be facing a lot of the sort of same struggles. And even the writers that we do know with representation are still having to grind and get to that next step. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember who said this to me because I, I would give credit if I could recall, but I think we made the comparison of like, view view um getting a manager like having an accountant like does your career do you have money do you does have- your career necessitate having a manager right now and, and in the same way that's that great. it's like if you've just got like your 1099 and your w2s you can probably file your own taxes right and you can you can get your own opportunities and develop your material and build that but if your career gets to a point where you need a rep it's just a much clearer kind of pathway right and getting to a point where you need a manager and need an agent um and that's not to say that people don't sign with representation very early in their very early in their career, but it's usually much more common that you've built up a degree of sort of like momentum and opportunity, and the manager's not um, just kind of picking somebody, uh, starting somebody from scratch. Because um, I think with uh, you know a couple of things, one, think about it from the perspective of the manager. Um, to to go back to the queries, we've seen a lot of writers that approach reps. And the consensus is, hey, you should sign me as a client because I really want a manager. Um, and it's like that doesn't like what does that do? <laughs> what that mean anything to them, right? Like look, this is their job, this is their livelihood. That yes, it is art and it's passion and it's emotion and it's this thing that they deeply care about but this is also their livelihood this is how they pay their bills um and their job is to assemble a roster of clients and projects that are going to make money that they collect a commission on um so it might not be the sole determinant in their decision but it's going to be a portion of it um so if you you know if you understand that yes they need to respond to the material, but also have this idea of where your career is going to look, right? And sort of have these opportunities and what working together is going to look like, um, getting to the part that you're a working writer in that conversation. Um, Because the other, I think it goes back to the sense of indie filmmaking, (laughs) which I, special place in my heart, my my heart is always in indie filmmaking and and will be in indie features. the economics of it don't always make sense to have a rep. Um, Because if I'm a rep and I get 10% of your projects and your deals and you make a low budget feature, let's just even say- 100 grand. Yeah, 100 grand, right? And so you, if you're making any money as the writer, director, you you know, it's, let's say you get 15 grand, right? Which is, no, there's no way that you would take 15% of the budget. Let's say that you get five Five, or 10 grand, five grand. And you're probably working on that project for like at least a year. That means that their commission is $500 for one year. Um, That even if they love you, love the project, care about the material, it just, it's really tough to dedicate much time to the job, anything, right? To $500 over 12 months um, versus something that's going to yield that. But I don't, I don't want to taint the perception because I really, I think so much about it, too, is just finding that right fit is finding the person that gets you, gets your material, gets this sort of vision for your career and you can work with um, and and building that relationship Um, at the same time. Don't underestimate your own ability to generate those opportunities. We come across writers all the time that have gotten 
their projects sold that have gotten themselves staffed on series that have episode credits that are getting sort of meetings with major studios and streamers. And there's no really one way to do it. It's just a lot of networking and leveraging relationships and sharing their material and maximizing those relationships that um, getting themselves to that point, the discussion of pursuing representation becomes so much easier, right? Because if you're, you're kind of painting this picture of like, hey, here's what my career is going to look like. It's much easier when it's tangible and you're working in a writer's room versus um, just off of like the samples, uh, if that makes sense. You it, know, it, 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 yeah, yeah, it does make sense. And I, I, I want to ask you as well, so many screenwriters will walk into a room you know, like let's say let's say perfect scenarios, they get a manager. Manager gets them a meeting at a studio because they mm -hmm. they had one sample script sure. that they loved, and they're like, "I like this guy's voice, or I like this gal's voice. Let's get him. Let's get him in, and let's have a, sure. a, a meet." They come in, they're like, "Okay, what do you? We love this script. We can't produce this. This is it's unpro <laughs> it's unproducible. What else do you have?" Right. So that's the moment where a lot of deer in headlights because they're like, "Wait a minute, that took me three years." Right. to do and I don't have any I have three ideas and if you have three ideas you're pretty much dead in the water because everybody has ideas everybody in that room has ideas but you can't produce an idea you got to produce a mm -hmm. script so how many scripts in your opinion is a good number to projects that you should walk into with a meeting like that like real like sure. real real things yeah I mean the, it's um I guess uh, two answers to that. Like one, the idea thing is interesting. I, I guess I won't say, but one of the more prestigious writing and directing fellowships, I've spoken to writers that have been through it, where the first couple of weeks is literally no writing, no development, just ideas. And they make you come up with a bunch of ideas and then they throw them out and make you come up with new ideas. And speaking to the writers that have been through that program, they say that is the most difficult part more so than notes and writing and rewriting because sure. you're just, you're, you're getting down to like the marrow of who am I as a creator? Like, what is my 25th idea? <laughs> right, is what it? is my 25th new fresh idea? Um, but I think that puts in perspective of just like the standard that you have to sort of hold yourself to as well as like, um, I think after a certain point, you get good at generating those ideas, knowing it um, to to your question with it, you know, the two parts of it, I would say the samples, I, I think most people really want to see what you can do. Um, and whether that is, I would say at least two, maybe, you know, if you've got like 15, it's sort of like, oh, man, this person just kind of like, how, how like polished are any of these, even if right. they are polished, the perception of seeing 15, I think. Um, so, so at least two, probably like three or four, but, but really the, the more important thing is having a consistency and like what your voice, what your talent is, what your perspective is and showing how it applies consistently, but in different means, you know, um, there is no shortage in the world, but especially in Southern California of people that can write just a really excellent tight feature or one hour or half hour pilot like that is not hard to come by so if you're going in with like oh i can write a feature you're kind of short changing <laughs> you know right? right i'm the horror feature writer like oh great you're the one you know? <laughs> we've been waiting for you bob poor bob bob really has no clue <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but like truly is as sentimental as it sounds like what no one else literally no one else in the world has is how you tell this story your right. perspective your experiences, what you yes. are bringing to the page. Um, and as much as you can articulate that as well as display that on the page, whether that's across four samples or two, whether it's across a you know, one hour procedural and a thriller feature, I think that's kind of the key to it. Um, and then within that meeting, yeah, that's every general ever, right? Which is we love this, the greatest thing ever, but it's not what we're making right now. So let's spend the next like 59 minutes figuring out what to talk about here. Um, and I think it goes back to what I was saying about networking, right? Which is if you don't make the effort to understand and you should have done, you know, hopefully you've done some research before the meeting, but if you don't make an effort to understand 
what is it that they're working on right now? What is it that they're developing? What is it that they're maybe struggling with or really looking for or excited about? And what do I have that fits that? Um, I think that's, again, it's a much easier discussion to have because you you know what you have in your arsenal. And if they happen to be looking for this high concept project that you've only kind of fleshed out a little bit and maybe only have a treatment for, you can get to that by asking those questions. Whereas if you just fired off, oh, I've got like a comedy feature sample in this one hour, you're now like 0 for 3 with them. Whereas you had this idea that they wanted to develop with you if you could have just sort of like worked to that in the conversation. And that's kind of typically the advice we give for for generals and things like that. The, yes, the water bottle tour. If, you, if you're lucky yes. enough to go on the water bottle tour, uh, that's it's good like advice. It's like the Zoom tour now, right? The, yeah, now it's the Zoom tour. Your own water bottle. <laughs> yeah, now it's the Zoom tour. You got to bring your own bottle, uh, <laughs> your own Yeti with you. Uh, <laughs> now, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Oh, my goodness. We're really... <laughs> <laughs> Who is Tom? <laughs> like, um, I guess I'll, I'll give both. I think, I think in the film industry, it's just, it's kind of seeing it for what it is. And I mean that in the best sense, right? It's like, it's an industry, industry, right? You know, and, and I think that anytime that you are asking people to, and you, to give you money <laughs> and in some cases, a lot of money to make your project or to write a project, you do have to understand that there's a degree of business that goes into it. Um, to, to recycle all my metaphors, I say, you know, Nike doesn't just like design a shoe and then put it on the shelves and hope that people buy it. Right. There's there's an entire presentation of why Nikes are cool and why you should buy them and why they're better than other shoes. And that's why you sell them. And like to a sense, that's what you have to do as a screenwriter. Um, and there's no substitute for excellent writing and the writing always comes first. But I think the tough lesson is like, understanding the business circumstances that go into most decisions, um, but accepting that that's okay. That is something that you can use to your advantage. And that doesn't mean that you have to, I don't know, rue that it's all about the money and you know, that it, you, you can navigate it and, and, and understand that to your advantage. Um, in life, I think like, I, you and I were talking before we started. I, I just think like getting getting a little older, you like calm down a little bit. <laughs> I, I think you, you just kind of trust that like, look, things are going to be OK. I, I've had enough sort of like one year, five year, 10 year plans that just kind of like go out the window, perhaps none more spectacularly <laughs> than in March of 2020 when I, you know, have spent the past year and a half and counting at home. Um, and I think that's really kind of informed the philosophy that we impart to writers, which is like, just remember what's important. Remember what the ultimate goal is. Don't make it harder on yourself by like defining the steps along the way, as well as saying that you have to do it. There's no timeline on this. Um, it, you know, there's there's tons of people that break in in their early 20s and their mid 30s or, or later, you know, just just have focus on what you're going to do and try and take steps towards that. Um, that's, that's the best I've got in terms of a life philosophy. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Uh, what are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Um, I'm going to go back to, I'm thinking of my, uh, I'm thinking of when in my reader days when I was reading at, um, uh, reading at Kevin Misher's company. Um, it had already come out, but I think that the screenplay for little miss sunshine mm. is just, Oh, so it's, brilliant. It, it's like, it's a, it's a novel. I, I don't know if we can retroactively give it like a Pulitzer or something. No, it or, is, or it is, it, it is a brilliant, it is a brilliant script and a brilliant film. Yeah. Br brilliant. And, and it's executed. a, to just to just sort of have this really this like dark quirky comedy that is this also deep exploration of 
Proustian philosophy that is like readily apparent on the first page and then perfectly executed for the rest of the script. That was the first one that came to mind. Um, I remember reading the script. This probably dates me, but I remember reading the script for Crazy Stupid Love. Oh, such a great script. Also, and, and a great script that when I read it, and I forget what draft I read was like near identical to the film that they ended up producing. Um, it, like down, down to the like lines of down, down to like specific words of, of just sort of, uh, I say that one, not necessarily for like a philosophical or thematic of just like, this is what a produced screenplay looks like. This is a, read the screenplay before I saw the film and then I saw the film and it was like, Oh, that's like verbatim that these guys just like got it up onto the screen. Um, man. then the last one, I feel like I should give a shout out to a cover fly writer. Um, no, I mean, this is three of all time. So you don't have to okay, feel three of all time. So they're not, uh, they're not whole. I mean, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, I guess that's prevalent now. I, I don't know how much it's changed, but again, from my like the last duel, which is finally coming out, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I say that to sort of put in perspective. Like there was some major talent attached to it when I read that script ten years ago, <laughs> and it is just coming out now. And I think it had kind of made the rounds then. Um, just in the sense of like, I say that one to maybe just be cheesy and that it can, it, it, sometimes it, it cause it is like some really A-list people were on that script and it still took 10 years, you know, it, to, to just, right. You never but know. I'm still pumped. I'm still pumped to see it cause it was amazing. And the, and the fact that I think that's a testament to reading hundreds, if not thousands of screenplays since then that I still, I still remember it. Um, and I, I don't know, I just gave myself goosebumps with it because there's, there is a, this is what we love about it, right? That it's just all about building that connection with the, with the material, um, that, that it does stick with you years and years after the fact. Thomas, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. I, I know we can continue talking for two, yeah. three hours more, but yeah. I, I, I truly appreciate it. I know you have a, a young one that you're taking care of. So, uh, yeah, and you're probably I, exhausted I, and you're probably I, exhausted. I, I've got a, uh, I have a two month old daughter. And so I've noticed that I just kind of start a sentence now and it just, I forget, I forget how I started it. And I just kind of go until I run out of steam. So hopefully your listeners and your viewers that this made, uh, that this made sense and bearing with me. Um, no, I, by all means, I think before we run out of time, head over to Coverfly. Yes, get, absolutely. Get the account set up. Um, you know, that's always kind of the first step, regardless of where you're at in your writing career, what you're looking to do. Um, just by creating the profile completely free to do so, we can find you and direct you to the resources that are um, that are most useful to what you're looking to do. Um, and, and our team will be able to support. And one of those resources, of course, is, uh, is the coverage service that we were talking about beforehand. Well, the so, coverage. Yeah. So I, 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 I truly, I truly appreciate you, brother. Thank you for doing all the good work you're doing with screenwriters out there and helping them navigate this shark infested, <laughs> you know, alligator snapping kind of world that, uh, sure. it is unfortunately, but I, I do truly appreciate you, man. Thank you again. My pleasure. I want to thank Thomas so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Thomas. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 146. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 